Welcome back, everybody, to the ATL Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shepard. I'm joined today by Colin Wilbur of Saxon Community College. Um, we got hooked up through through Twitter. Um, so I don't know if Coach seen some of our posts and he reached out or we reached out to him. I can't I can't exactly remember. Um, it was a while ago that we got connected. We're finally getting to sit down and chat. Um, we got another catching guy on today, which is exciting. I think we've only had one other catching guy in the past. Um, however, Coach Wilbur has big shoes to fill. Uh, our last catching yeah. guy was great. So we'll 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 see how he does. We'll give him a great after today. But um, <laughs> Coach, why don't you tell us? Obviously, you know, like we said, you're at Sac City right now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got there and where, where are you where you came from? Yeah, first of all, just appreciate you having me on. I know uh, Shu is your last catching guy, right? That is big yeah. shoes. He's he's a stud. Uh, you've had some good ones, dude, from Sheets to Champ Bailey and, and everything yeah. in between. I'm, yeah. I'm a big podcast guy, so I'm always looking to listen. Um, but, yeah, kind of a interesting coaching journey, I guess you would say. I've, I've been all over the place. Uh, my last year – after I got done playing, I uh, played at Christopher Newport University Division yeah. Three in Virginia, and yeah. then uh, played at the Newport News Apprentice School, which is kind of a unique journey in its own right. Um, but I won't have to unhash all that right now. But uh, so, coached at a uh, uh, at my old high school for the first year while I was still working at a shipyard. Uh, so went there and like just just really fell in love with it and then just decided to go all in on coaching. Uh, my brother and I, for whatever reason, decided to move up to Michigan. Okay. Uh, my dad's got uh, <laughs> my dad's got Detroit roots, so we moved up to Detroit for a year. So I uh, went back and finished school. worked as a worked as a uh, student assistant slash manager at uh, Eastern Michigan University for a year. Yeah. And was doing what, some what lessons. Year were, and what stuff. year were you there? That was 18, I believe. Who was, the, who was the head coach? Eric Roof. Okay. Yeah, so from Concordia, got an offer to to uh, go coach at Inspiration Academy, which is, uh, if you're familiar with IMG, it's kind of a similar model on a much smaller scale it's a small Christian school that kind of revolves around tennis and baseball. I uh, did a bunch of different roles there from Where was always that? catching. That's in Bradenton, Florida. Yeah. It's literally five minutes from, from IMG, uh, 20 minutes from Pirate Spring Training Complex. Um, but yeah, I did a bunch of different things there. was always in charge of the catching. I did social media we got this bats video system that I ended up being in charge of. And then like the last year or so I was like the director of player development. So kind of in charge of, of everything as well as like the scheduling and all that. Um, And yeah. And then from there uh, spent two years with the pirates as a minor league catching and game planning coach at the high A level. Um, and then, yeah, just decided to jump out of that and kind of wanted to get back into college baseball, be closer to my fiance. And she was living about 20 minutes from Sacramento and Davis. So Sac City just kind of worked out. And that's where I'm at now. How far was the, where were you at with uh, spring training in Florida, the Pirates? Yeah, in Florida. Yep. Right into Florida. Yeah, man. I mean, it cuts. It's crazy. It it comes. So many coaches have to make that that decision of the fiance, not not one yeah. or the other, but like it, it it can her job move? Can yeah, my job move? Oh, I can't find a job where she is working and she's yeah. she makes way more money than I do. Like so <laughs> now I'm, you know, I'm a BSN rep. You know, like like or yeah. Uh, now I'm done coaching and I'm going to college or I'm going to, you know, teach because that's what my degree is in. It's it's amazing how many questions or how many coaches that happens to. Um, it's just the nature sure. of the beast. So how's Cali living yeah. though? And, and wake up and there's 10 a.m. football games on Sunday. It makes me jealous. Oh, um, man, that's the best part about it, bar none. I, I'm a diehard Lions fan, so waking up in the morning, 
getting ready for the Lions games 10 a.m. is awesome. There you go. Awesome. Love it. Um, I'm a Browns fan, so I don't know who's... Okay. <laughs> when we were knocked out, like, I was really, really rooting for you guys because I know what it's yeah. like to have... <laughs> you know what it's like, man. A it's... football team that's just trash and you're finally yes. good. But you guys are fun, man. I mean, <laughs> are you a Dan it's Campbell fun fan? right now. I love Dan Campbell. Yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in. I don't. I don't think people realized how, how good of a coach he actually is. Like, you know, his first press conference, he was like getting made fun of because yeah. he said, "Like, oh, we're gonna bite their kneecaps on the way back up." Like, yeah, like, this guy's a meathead, but like, yeah, he actually, is great. And I mean, as long as you mm-hmm. guys keep that offensive coordinator, you, you, you. Yeah. Got, I mean, your team probably would be better off having him as a head coach as opposed to like losing him. Unless yeah. you got someone in the wings, but you just throw that guy all the money in the world because, like, what? Yeah, they've been great. But and anyways, seems, anyways, seems to be happy. We'll keep him here, keep him around. So back to back to baseball things. Um, catching wise, what do you think for for high school kids? At, let's say not even not just before high school, thirteen year olds. Hmm. What's the most low hanging fruit? What can like what's the biggest thing, the biggest skill that needs to be developed or is not developed enough? Like what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um I actually did a whole presentation on this um for I spoke at the uh, Illinois High School uh convention last year and they kind of gave me, hey, like you could talk about whatever you want within catching. Right. Um, so I was like, okay, well, and, and I was in a good spot at the time because I had just I had just switched over to getting into Sacramento, kind of learning the area. I had just started working uh with the travel ball kids, the Sacramento Sports Center, started working with catchers naturally, right? Like they're like, Oh, we got a good catching guy, like let's throw all our catchers at this guy. And uh, I think it's just immediately every kid comes in and it's like, oh, I can't block. I really struggle with blocking. Anytime I get a new catcher, uh, I'll take him in every week. Oh, I struggle with blocking. I, I, I'm really – I can't get to this pitch. I can't get to that pitch. Um, and I think a lot of it stems from bad stances. A lot of guys just way too wide butts way too high and you know the old adage forever has been well we got to be athletic right we got to get we get worried about all of this range we got to have range worried about the and obviously you know at those lower levels the range is is higher than it is in college ball and it is in pro ball and and all the way up um but it's always just this concern with like the five percenter blocks or the one percenter blocks. Or how am I going to get to this? How am I going to get to that? Uh, when I think the reality is the best blocker, like Tanner Swanson has this quote that I like screenshotted and like keep it on me forever. Like the best blockers are the guys who convert the easy blocks most consistently, mm-hmm. not the guys with just crazy range right and obviously the range the rangier is that even a word the rangier blocks <laughs> it is today, it <laughs> we'll is today. yeah right the higher range blocks will go that um they become important right and it's a plus and it all factors in um but the really good blockers are the guys who convert just the easy low range blocks the most and i think we're just kind of looking at the problem and the wrong way and it's just it's and it's a thing that i deal with every day every guy mm-hmm. every catcher i get comes in and that's like starting from scratch and that's like so just trying to to attack stances and and switch the understanding of of what what the actual problem is and what we should be solving for and then just trying to take it from there so it's almost like the shortstop that you just want them to make the routine plays, and then if you if you make the routine plays, we'll work off of that to increase your range and make make the good. Like if you 
you can't make the routine plays at shortstop, then you know what are you, you know what are you good for? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, just because uh, you're gonna get so many more routine balls or routine blocks than you are like, you know, a a, a sweet one. It's it's all it's all hedging bets, right? It's it's reprioritizing the things that that happen the most often, which I think we all know at this point. Like you receive, you catch the ball more than you do anything else, right? And then it's blocking, then it's throwing, and obviously there's. There's differences with levels, right? But yeah, it's all just prioritizing first the catch, second, easy, the easy blocks, right? Like the lower mm-hmm. range blocks, and then trying to figure out how to do everything else around those two things, right? Being able to control the ball from a receiving standpoint, especially at the bottom of the zone, where we know that that's, that's what happens the most often. And then those low range blocks, and then trying to figure out how to do everything else around that. And it's not that we're like, Hey, well, like I just don't care about those 1% or blocks or 5% or blocks, whatever those high range blocks. It's about being creative and finding ways to get successful at the things that, that happen the most and figuring out the rest around that versus I have to be in the spot for this 1% or, and I'm kind of punting on the things that happen more often. What a you said their their stance is bad. Like their you think their initial setup is Yeah. You think we have bad setup. Elaborate more on that. Like you think they're not being square, you think uh their butt's too high, you think elaborate a little bit on that on setup. Yeah, generally it's 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 butt too high, way too wide. And what that ends up doing is like, it really commits you to one spot, right? Like you're going to dominate that, that block that's right at you, that kind of like short block that's right at you. Right. But because you have to, you have such a, this big move where your butt's so high and you have to make that decision so early because you're so wide and you have to make this big move to get from way far from the ground to get to the ground you end up just not being super accurate right or you're really accurate to that one that's right at you but the more that it actually those kind of easier ones that are not super rangy or slightly to your right slightly to your left those are the ones that end up kicking off the arm and squirting to the other dugout because you had to make that decision so early versus being in a little bit more of a relaxed setup or maybe even putting a knee down. I know I might get chastised for that, but <laughs> um, just being able to to see that ball a little bit longer and, and make that decision a little bit later, help you be a little bit more accurate. When you have runners on base, like what do you like, what do you teach your catchers with? I know we're in a total, I wouldn't even say new. It's just been, it's been around for a little while now with, how we receive pitches and framing, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it's the knee, the knee down. Guys are so low. Like when you have runners on base, how do you how do you teach that to your to your guys? Is it uh, you can do it, and you've proved it to me. You're good. Like, wh- how do you how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the tough part. Is obviously, you know, like if if I've got my Sac city guys, like we're going to start experimenting knee down day one. And like the staff knows that that's something that we're going to do. And uh, I've seen a lot of success with it. And I've, I've been doing it since 2019 with middle schoolers up to minor leaguers. And I've really just haven't seen anyone get worse from it. Um, so and, and that's where it's a little bit tougher, you know, in the private sector or you're working with guys who play for the travel wall team and their coach might say, Hey, like, no, we don't do that here. Um, it's, they do have to probably prove it a little bit more, but I, if they're open to, to learning it, then I'm going to teach it to them because I believe in it. And I think we're just seeing it, you know, and it's, I think so, sometimes people have, a hard time 
seeing major league data and thinking that that equates to to what's going on at, at lower levels and i i guess i understand that that skepticism a little bit but i think the reality is there's, there's not a whole lot that goes on at the big league level the minor league level that that doesn't happen at every other level of the game just a different scale it's a different scale and obviously maybe there's there's some extremes that mm. you know we do have a little bit more extreme myths or whatever but if we're we're scaling our system around that that one pitch that two pitches then i think we're missing the boat on being able to be really good at what happens more often speaking of major leagues um here's a question i have uh with obviously we we can do so many the the runs the runs saved metric by figuring out how many strikes you create that you shouldn't versus how many pitches that were balls that should have been strikes like that stuff blows my mind it's amazing how much data we can track and it, what's even more amazing is there is people out there that actually will spend all of their time to go through that data is nuts yeah. but <laughs> it was my life for about two years so what happens when you have these catchers who save all these runs because they get all these strikes. Mm -hmm. And we go to automatic umpires, robot umpires, wh whatever the yeah. term. What's the, what's the term? Um, they're not going to call them robot umpires. A it's a a B ABS. ABS. Because they're using it in, in, in some parts of the minors now. Yeah. So, yeah. so all of those, all of those guys that, we're horrible at pitch framing and now that you can't get a job because it's like, well, you're, you're costing us six strikes a game or three strikes a game, whatever it is. Yeah. Now what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it obviously becomes more of an offensive position. I think teams become more willing to, you know, just kind of throw, certain guys back there and see if they can figure it out. Um, I think there's going to always be some element of receiving framing that's still going to matter to the pitcher, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, there's obviously that just like that mental factor for the pitcher being able to see that, like I made a good pitch and the catcher just didn't just like totally take it out of the zone <laughs> yeah. because it doesn't, because it doesn't matter. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, it definitely takes a, takes a toll on all these, I would say advance advancements that we've made in catching. I feel like in the last five, 10 years, it's yeah. totally changed and there's so many, so much better information, so many more good catching minds out there. Um, it would really stink to see that happen. I hope that they try the challenge system before if they're going to do it. I hope that they try the challenge system because I think it keeps all of those things still in play. Right. Um, Where not every single kind of call is just, it's, it's mainly yeah. umpire and you get, well, how is it in the minors now? I mean, I, I should have researched this, but is it, I, I, I thought from a video I watched on, on Twitter, or whatever, one time that was like, there's a delay and, the umpire has like a, a headset in and they say it's striker ball. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty is quick. It run, uh, is it run both ways where it's like they can challenge it? Like it's the umpire's game and then they can challenge X amount of calls per game. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's the umpire's game. He's calling it the whole game. And then I, I want to say it's each team has like three challenges. And then obviously if you get it right, then like you don't lose that challenge. Right, but if you go over three in your first three in the first inning, then I think you're screwed. I'm not totally positive on that, but that's way better. I than think that's just how it works. everything automated, in my opinion. And it, and it's quick too. Like if you see if you see videos of it recently, it's like as simple as like it's hitter, catcher, yeah. pitcher. Like hey, challenge. Yeah, 
back up at the video board. Okay, ball or strike, move on. Yeah, I mean, or, or you could just give, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure there's people that are way smarter, way more in touch than us figuring out, but, like, if you gave each hitter one challenge a game, if it's that quick, just, it's on the hitter, and then if he wins yeah. it, he still gets to keep it. If he loses it, then it's gone. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, I think there's a lot of possibilities with it, and I think it, it opens up a whole nother level of kind of strategy to it that I think you know, yeah. keeps baseball even more interesting. That's what I, I, I like that where, I mean, you got to understand that like we, we do need to, I don't want to say modernize baseball, but well, like there is an older dying out crowd that was the baseball fans in the younger generation. I, It's hard because it's the game that we love, but also do you love it enough that you want to see it grow? And change, or are you like, I don't say stuck in your ways, but all this pastime, and we can't change it because it's great the way it was. And it, there's this, uh, I'm, uh, I think we need to make the changes. Well, a lot of the changes that they've made today in Pro Bowl have been great. Like, you know, the, the pitch clock, and I, I know that a lot pitch of people, awesome, dude. I know a lot of people will push back on that with the injuries and and with people throwing harder nowadays and I love the three batter minimum. I mean, I, I think, you know, the pitching changes take forever. Uh, the, I like the mount, you know, even the mound visit, it, it, everything, it's just quicker and it gets people yeah. to the game more. Cause I would rather much, I would much rather go to a baseball game in person than watch it on TV. Whereas opposed to like going to a football game in person is miserable. I, I, not miserable. It's it's not. I will sit on my couch. Not the same. I will sit on my couch with red zone or Sunday ticket from one p.m. all the way till eleven or twelve p.m. and it's the best. But when you go to a game, yeah. you just a football game. Like you don't realize how much downtime there is. And I think it's because we're used to like, oh, there's a commercial. There's six other games being played. Let me just flip over to the other one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. If we can speed it up, you look at a basketball game, it's always like, what, an hour and a half? And you're in, you're out. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's quick, and it's just the way, it's the way things are, um, you know, with our generation. And I think if we want to keep growing the game, we just, we have to change it. But I think that would be a much better, I hope that's what they adopt if they bring it to. Because I I do appreciate a good art form, right? Like the framing of pitches, again, if you will, for lack of better terms, is like, it's an R. It's cool to see. It's, it's, you can bring something to the game that the next guy can't, yeah. you know? Um, and guys are, guys are really good at it nowadays. Like that, that gap from the worst guy to the best guy oh, is, is yeah. closing every day. You know, like there's, there's a lot of good. Mm-hmm coaches that are emerging and a lot of good got a good catchers that are that are working a lot at this stuff and it would just it would suck to see it's so smooth man like i coach travel ball i i always i don't know i don't know why i do it but i, I love warming up the pitcher in between innings when our catcher's not ready like when i see our catchers on base yeah. i'm like they're like let's get a pinch runner i'm like listen guys he needs to it's learn to run. he needs to learn to run the bases when he gets to college, so like let's let him run the bases. No one, I'm gonna be like, yo, mitt, mitt. I, I don't know, I like doing yeah. it, but like you know, I I start messing around with with it, and it's it's like to get the timing is like it's hard, and it is. You see really guys hard. that when a, if you see a guy who's super duper smooth, you you might not like notice it right away, but then a guy comes in. I notice this when I I I run a lot of showcases. And you're throwing to the catchers, and you see a guy that's like really smooth. You don't notice it. And then the next guy comes in, and he's rough. And you're and then the next guy comes in, and he's smooth. And you're like, okay, like the difference yeah. is is even more yeah. than it was in the old way. You know what I mean? The difference between yeah. like really good and really bad, or like guys that haven't had good coaching, but they're trying to do it. You can tell it's like mm-hmm. you, you need to have someone teach you how to do this. Yeah. No doubt. So, I think that's that's probably the biggest thing now is there's 
I think that's why there's even more pushback on the way it's going now is because there's so many kids out on their own who just see highlights on Instagram or reels on Instagram. And they're like, well, this is the way the game's going. This like, I need to figure this out. And there's obviously a lot of little details, you know, within stances and receiving and all the things that, that allow you to be successful. And now guys are just kind of trying it on their own. And I love that. I think that's a great thing for the game, but I think that's, that's why there's, there's some disconnect, right? Because there's coaches out there who are unwilling to learn. And there's players out there who realize that this is probably the get, the way that the game's moving. I need to try and figure it out. And now there's that gap is just being increased. I do appreciate like, trying it and the trying it on your own, teaching your own. There is some things that you need help with. No doubt. There's no some doubt. things that's I mean, just it's, like, it's just like anything else. It's like, like pitching, hitting, like everyone goes and does their pitching, hitting lessons nowadays. Right. Like you need a coach to, to help you navigate uh, these things. Yeah. But you got to have a, I mean, you, and you've probably seen it too, where it's like, I walk into the park and I see some guys get, that are given lessons and I'm like, Oh man. Yeah. It's... I'm like, who, who, is, <laughs> who is, who is this dude? I'm like, yeah. And then you kind of just are hanging out there for a minute, you know, and then you're listening and it's like, who, who are, who's paying you money to do this? Yeah. And it, it, it almost, I mean, I don't know. I, obviously I don't know everything and I'm not, you know god's gift to coaching like some people think but yeah you you know when things are blatantly wrong i'm not talking about little intricacies because yeah. there's some there's more ways yeah. you know there's more ways than one to, to teach the same thing or you know yeah. more ways than one to be successful but no doubt and, and let me back that up a little bit because i didn't i didn't want to i don't want it to come off as like everybody needs a, a private catching coach and stuff like that but we just need to get we need to get the masses of coaches more on the same page like we need to close the gap between what the 12 u coach who's just doing this because his kids on the team and what he knows versus like you know what the what the really good coaches at whatever level know and just being able to close that gap i think just puts everybody in a better place that's the hard part though like these guys are dads. They're volunteers at 12U, and I don't, I don't blame those guys for teaching what they teach. I mean, no. the guys I walk past that I know are giving lessons, lessons for 50, 100, 150 bucks, and I'm like, what did you say to tell him to yeah. do with his back elbow? Um, <laughs> you know, or it's like 60 minutes of T work or front toss. Yep. Um, but it. It's tough because how much time do that, like those guys are donating their time or they're making a couple bucks or a, a case of beers. How much, sure. how much time do they have to learn something like this, right? Like this isn't just how to throw and catch, you know, how to throw a four seam fastball like this. This is, mm -hmm. I would say it's, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is with, with the framing and the, the new way of catching it's, it's, it's special. It's, it's yeah. a, a specialty it's specialized. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. So yeah, what, I, I mean, mean, guys like I mean, you I, and Chu and like, Tan, like you guys, you know, you, you yeah. need to make a, uh, how to for dummies really. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I would love to do that. I mean, I, like I've, I've backed off of it, but I used to post a ton on social media and that was, that was a lot of the reason I did it was, was both for that coach who's just like trying trying to do right by his 12 u team or his high school team and and he didn't catch and he's not a catching expert mm -hmm. but he realizes he recognizes the shift and it's like i need to learn this right and also that kid that we we're just talking about like that 13 14 to 18 year old kid who's playing high school ball or middle school trial ball whatever and also recognizes the shift and like I need to try and figure this out. So, and, and if anybody ever shoots me a DM or whatever, like I will always respond to it 
and it might not be in the next 30 seconds, but I'll always get back to that guy who is looking to learn and just, you know, send me video. Like I, I'll always respond because we try to put, put better information out there. And again, just trying to close that gap. So like f- for hitting, for example, if I was going to talk about like what, let's say a 12 U coach or 13 volunteer coach or low level. Um, we didn't want to get too deep in the, in the weeds, something that they didn't understand. So they weren't like teaching quote unquote wrong things. Some of the things I would tell them it would be important would be like swinging with intent. Something you can always monitor. Uh, I, I would say like do less T work and, Stop mm-hmm. focusing on mechanical things and do more velocity work off the machine and throwing inside pitches and having kids keep the ball fair. Because I think if you can keep it inside pitch fair, your mechanics are probably pretty sound. And if you give kids different, you know, you know, it's like instead of if a kid miss hits a ball, instead of telling him three mechanical things to do, if you just say, Hey, listen, hit the ball, aim here. A lot of times, Mm -hmm. like their mind will adjust their body and correct something to be able to do a goal. So with catching, what would you say at a, I don't even want to put an age group on it. Let's just say someone that is starting catching brand new, no Mm -hmm. catching experience, but we want to, mold them into a catcher that can that can specialize in the framing what are two or three of the most important like if you can do this well you can have success like is it low fastball at the knees and catching it coming up like what's you know what i mean yeah yeah i would say one would be just be willing to experiment with stances like it doesn't just need to be the two feet primary, the two, the two feet secondary it doesn't need to just be a knee. It's like, try all of it and like be willing to experiment with it. And if you see something that looks weird, it's probably weird. And like, just try to give them something slightly different, you know, like if they're way too hunched over or way too tall, but just like little adjustments like that. Like if it looks weird, it's probably weird. Mm-hmm. So just, just try and try and uh, experiment with those things. I would say probably my favorite thing to do. And I, I, I'll mention this cause I did it with a couple of kids last night that I had never worked with 12 year olds. Um, I had the machine going, you don't need a machine to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, we had foam balls. One of them didn't have a cup. So it's like, okay, like let's not, uh, let's not hurt your chances of having a kid one day. Um, but it's just getting them in their different stances that they like to use. And what I'll do is, you know, you can do it with a fastball. You can do it with a curveball. They're like, hey, we want to block curveballs, so let's do curveballs. It's a not an overpowering curveball off the machine. And what I'll do is just kind of like manipulate the machine up and down to whether it's like that bottom of the zone catch and receive, try and control it, or it's a block. And, you know, you can make it as hard as you want or as easy as you want, you know, depending on the skill level or how they're looking, right? Just trying to keep that success rate from like 60 to 80%, right? And you can turn it up or turn it down, you know, kind of based on how that's going. Um, And then just just kind of gauge their success level. It's like probably the closest thing you can do to, you know, outside of just catching a bullpen that's, most realistic to a game, you know, like similar to what you're saying, like, you know, overcoaching the mechanics on the T work or the front toss or whatever. And it's just, let's put this and put them in a semi game like situation and let's see how they do. And Hey, which stance did you feel the best with receiving in? Okay, cool. Which one about blocking? Okay. Are they the same one? Great. Like that's probably a really good option for you. Um, and then, yeah, the, just the receiving work, you know, just for sure the low pitch is is the one where you're going to have the most opportunities, but just, you know, getting creative with it, different 
pitch shapes, different angles, and you can throw all this. You don't need anything crazy. You don't need super high tech machines or foam balls or anything crazy. Like you can flip, you can throw, um, and just, just experimenting with those setups, not over coaching the blocking and, and what it looks like, just valuing being able to stop the ball and keep the runner from advancing. And then obviously receiving component, especially at the bottom of the zone, just working up through it. One move. It's a lot. It's not, it's not a <laughs> yeah. lot, but it's how, how, how often would you say they need to be doing drill work versus live pens? And how, how many days a week is this like you want to be doing stuff six days a week? Is it like when season rolls around and you're catching four games a week, you really don't want to do a ton of bullpen because you want to be off your legs? Like what, what do you think for a workload for catchers? Um, I, I, like you said, I, I think it just kind of depends on where you are in the season, right? If you're, you know, if you're the typical travel ball kid, you're just playing on the weekends, like would love to get some work in, whether it's on your own or with a coach, you know, two days a week. And then one day, maybe you're just catching pens and you're trying to refine all those things that, that you worked on in your work. Um, you know, if you're the minor league guy or college guy, you're playing four to six days a week. Maybe it's just little touch points, like five to 10 minutes of work mm -hmm. where it's just like, I know these are two of the things that get me dialed in. And then this is one thing that's game-like that I feel like is going to get me right to catch the starter or whatever. Um, and yeah, just doing that, you know, three to four times a week, five, 10 minutes, stay sharp, keep working on things that you need to improve and, maintaining the strengths that you have now what about like transition a little bit to like away from blocking into rowing okay. obviously arm strength is huge i, I yeah. don't think i don't think we need to go in into that arm that program is it's not much of a different arm strength program than, than pitching or in infield outfit no. unless you tell me there is and you know i don't think so no i don't think it's any different than the same way you would develop a pitcher or an infielder or outfielder or whatever i don't think it's all the same for uh, how do you coach a kid to get his his pop time down you know as 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 low as he can you think a lot of it is that's a loaded question you could you could spend hours but no you're, you're, you're good you're good um no like to be honest like that is like you get the lesson and the dad comes in and like that's always the question right how do i get his pop time down it's like well i've never even seen the kid throw or playing a game so it is a little bit tough but um, I just try and get guys like, you know, as, as close as we can to a semi game setting where I'm just throwing at them. And that's like, Hey, you're make five throws, like pretend like you're throwing this guy out at second or whatever. And, and just kind of evaluating video from there. I would say <laughs> in most cases, the, the youth kid, maybe even the college kid, um, they don't, they take too long to get rid of it. And, if the arm strength's really plus, you can get away with not getting rid of it as quick, right? But if you're not that kid who's just really gifted with, with plus arm strength, getting rid of it quicker is always going to be the low-hanging fruit there. So quite simply, like a lot of the time, all, all I'm focused on is like how quick can you get your right foot in the ground and how quick can you get the ball in the air and be inaccurate right aiming a little bit you know you know right on the bag or a little bit up the line towards the first baseman on a lower trajectory and just how quickly can we get it there interesting um 
accuracy. I feel like I seen something a couple years back, uh, maybe even longer than that, about like how important like where you place it is. Like every two feet that it's offline is like another foot for the base runner. Like for between yeah. being able to like catch and tag. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? I mean, obviously, do you do you harp on that every time? Like if you're in practice, you guys are just doing throwdowns. Like, are you? I feel like throwdowns don't get practiced enough because catchers throw so much. Yeah. You know, catch, like, I mean, I'm catching pens is light, light toss, but like catchers throw as, you know, think about all the pitches are thrown in the game. You throw one back and then you're throwing down in between innings and then you got your IO. I, I, I just feel it's always like, yeah, coach, I don't want to throw down today. Like, wow, well, I'm yeah. cooked. You know what I mean? So how yeah. do you maximize that? The amount of throws you're going to take in practice yeah i think it's that that's a constant constant struggle at every level um i would have guys in minor league baseball where it was like they would come from you know their college or whatever and it was like yeah we had to we had to take io and make 10 to 12 throws in that io six days a week so you're like, you're telling me I don't have to throw every day. And they like would think it was the best thing ever. So I think a lot of it comes to like managing that workload and like trying to, trying to get them in a routine of, you know, maybe it's not throwing down every day, but maybe it's in your catch play, just making sure, you know, you can kind of get to that distance or somewhere close to it and make three to five throws and, work on whatever you feel like you need to work on being accurate, getting rid of it quickly, um, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be at a thousand percent where, you know, that adrenaline's rushing, this guy's taking second. Um, it can be at a lower intent and just for field based thing and trying to work on something. Uh, I think when, when you get guys in a practice scenario where they are trying to like practice throwdowns, it's like, I have to go balls to the wall or it's, it's meaningless. So it basically it's just like you got to lock in for your, for your four throws. Yeah. For your, or for your catch play. Um, and you know, if you're a guy who uses weighted balls, like maybe making, you know, four to six of those at the end of your, you know, end of your routine, whatever drills you do, maybe it's just four to six of I'm going to get in my stance and try to pretend like I'm throwing a guy out at second here and just making that part of your, your daily routine. Um, totally flipping topics. Okay. What, what do you think you may not have an opinion on this at all? The 34 main roster change with Division One. I. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you think it's going to do to college baseball? What do you think it's going to do to the bigger programs, like the power fours, yeah. like the the mid major D ones? Do you, do you think what's the trickle down effect going to be all the way down to D three? What do you, you, you you're you have your hand or have been in almost every level? I mean, you've been in high school. You give <laughs> you give lessons. You coach college. You've been in the pro ball. Like you play D three, what do you think? How is that trickle down effect gonna affect everything? Yeah, I think it's just gonna push more guys to lower levels. Whether that's, you know, hopefully that helps some mid major schools where those, the Tennessees and the Texas, you know, I'm not like just naming schools, right? LSU's whatever. Like those guys aren't gonna bring forty five, fifty guys in in the fall and then cut them in the spring or cut them before the spring. And then it's a scramble to get those guys that are left. Uh, I mean, hopefully it pushes some of those guys to those mid majors. It's, or maybe it's Juco, maybe it's the, the university of Tampa's, the North Greenville's, the powerhouse D2 NAIA schools. Um, but it, it's gotta be as hard as ever to be a mid major coach right now where, mm -hmm your good players are always up for grabs after they have a good year. So, I mean, hopefully 
hopefully some of those guys will get to those schools and hopefully stick around there because of that roster limit. But yeah, I don't know. I'm not probably coming to the, going to the Cape this summer was probably the most in tune I had been with in college baseball in a while, but yeah, navigating all the things that the, that kind of kid has to navigate at this time in college baseball is crazy. So I don't envy that, but hopefully that, you know, provides some clarity at, at every level. And it's probably going to make it harder on the high school kid again, but I don't know. I guess we'll see. Yeah. I mean, that's from, I mean, even before that, there was a lot of like college division one coaches that were like, not even division, just division one, like sheets straight up came on the podcast and said, yeah, we don't recruit to college kids. Like, yeah. Or yeah. high school kids. Sorry. Like maybe one a year, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, they're going to get division one kids that didn't work out. They're going to get Juco transfers. And I mean, I think with only having 34, you only have so many bullets, man. So it's like, kid coming out of a uh, juco for one or two years like you know he's already close to that finished product so you know what you're getting and coaches want certain the coaches want the certainty right like they want to know what for they're sure. getting and i think you just have to be that much better and i think it's gonna be a trickle down effect like we're like i think d3 baseball is still already underrated like i don't no think doubt. a lot of kids don't go watch games so like they don't understand where they're like, well, I mean, it's D3. I'm like, you wouldn't sniff. Yeah. You wouldn't sniff the field <laughs> at that D3, brother. Like, yeah, I got, we got a couple kids that go play at, at Denison and, and they're there now. And a couple other kids are committed there and they're division three. They got like five arms in the, in their, in their, on their staff that are over 90. But yeah. That's just over 90. I'm going to talk about like high eighties. Like they could pitch, you know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, soft throwing lefty that gets out and would bat perfect game and yeah. turn their nose up at D3. It's like, dude, I don't think you know, but like, I, I mean, I think it's underrated already. And I think the trickle down effect is going to be if more kids are willing to go that route and not say, like, okay, well, I just, I'm not going to play baseball. I'm going to go to Auburn and go yeah. pursue other things. I think like Division three baseball is going to be like, ridiculous like just even better than it was and i think more kids will go juco like the the kids that maybe would have went mid major d1 or vision two will you know go juco and then after their year two they'll say i love baseball i want to keep playing but i don't have a spot d1 or maybe they'll say i better myself and i got a division one opportunity but it's gonna be tough for mid majors dude like no doubt I don't know why they did that. Did, I mean, what did, did they do that so they could say like, well, now mid majors can fund their whole program? Did they think yeah. that that was going to create more parity? Because like, when you the big schools are always going to be able to like with NIL, like it doesn't. There's nothing you could do now that will. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they just thought like if we cut down the rosters, those extra six kids will go down to mid majors. And they'll be able to play because they're probably good enough. I don't know. I don't know. What they're doing. yeah. I mean, I think it, in in theory it sounds good, right? It's like, oh well, everyone can have thirty four scholarships now, and it's like, well, yeah, no, that's not actually the case because you have to be able to fund them, which is a whole other issue. So I don't know, man. It's 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 like we said, it's a it's a hard time to be a mid major coach and constantly trying to recruit and re-recruit your players and there's probably a part of them where it's like dang i get it like yeah arkansas is offering you a full scholarship and and 250 and nil like how can you turn that down and i don't blame you you know so it's it's a hard time and it's hopefully there's there's got to be some rules set to where it it does bring some of that that parity back not that there's you know, a total lack of parity in college baseball now, but you could definitely see how it sways away from that uh, in coming years for sure. Um, I actually think, like, 
I love sending our guys to mid major D ones or D threes because like we've sent I don't even know what the number is. We've never had one of our players that we've sent to college transfer to another school. And like I I mean I hang my hat on that. Like I love that because I think for me I'm big on finding the right fit. So like if you're not transferring, we've found the right fit. Like and we're good on that. I know when we send them to like the division three or the mid majors, and not that division like power fours or D twos, like their coaching staffs don't give a shit. But I know that like that mid major coach isn't like turning his roster over every single year. Like the kids he has, like he has to invest in them. He he can't just say, Oh, this kid sucks, like he was just bringing someone else. Like they may bring in a couple transfers a year to fill in some some holes, but they got to develop what they have. And if it's not working, we got to try something different. Like, like, no doubt. One of the, it wasn't one of our players, but one of the schools that we sent quite a few guys to a mid major, like, we brought a kid in and he was like just average over the top. And it was like not getting out. It's just getting battered around. They dropped him down to the side and he's like pitched and they're out of their bullpen against LSU and the, you know, the regionals. And it was like, a coach could have just said, like, all right, you're just, you're not working out, bro. You didn't have mm-hmm. to, like, hey, we're going to drop you down to the side and try something different. So that's just, you know, I, I, I really do love the mid major D3 route because I, I just think they get, they just get more attention. They get more, more love. I know that, I know they're going to be cared about, even if it's not the just, they're not the four hole hitter or they're not the ace. Yeah. So. You have to, right? You have to. As a coach at that, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, it hopefully it spreads out. So, and I would say I I feel like kids in at least in this area, I can't, you know, obviously it, the perception and all that becomes a little bit different in different areas. But kids here are very willing to go JUCO. I don't feel like it was that way, you know, where I grew up in Virginia. Like I felt like JUCO oh, was yeah, like, no. oh well, you. You were just trash. So, like, you, you were trash you or you were JUCO. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> or stupid. Yeah. But, like, now but there's, it, there's smart kids that go Juco. Like, it's not that it's not like sure. it used to be. We have plenty of kids, like, borderline valedictorians that, like, come to Sac City because they come here and they, you know, spend two years here and hopefully they can go to Cal or UCLA or Cal State Fullerton or, you know, wherever it is that they want to end up. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully it you know pushes more talent to to every level and kind of evens it out. I I do. I was gonna say like uh, I feel like kids here are more willing to to take that D three offer out of high school or take that D two NAI offer that feels like a better fit and and stick it out there or with the possibility of like oh if I can go in here and ball for a year or two then I can maybe transfer to that school that I initially wanted to go to that didn't have room for me at high school. Uh, Coach, we end every podcast with uh, something. We're, we're called the ATL Lightning, so um, we, we call it the Lightning Round at the end. Um, we so we'll, unless there's anything else that you haven't talked about today about catching, uh, that you want to mention that you need to get off your chest if, if you want to go on, <laughs> on a rant or anything or no no i'm good rants or rants are over i've ranted enough all right uh so just a string of questions you can answer them quick um is a hot dog a sandwich i'm gonna say no hot dogs its own category does pineapple go on pizza absolutely all in your favorite baseball player currently or growing up doesn't matter okay i'll say I'll, I'll give both currently i love watching jose trevino i think he's the gold standard for catching he's so much fun to watch uh as a kid pudge rodriguez it had to be pudge right yep your favorite gatorade flavor um I'm going to go white. Pitching duel or offensive clinic? 
Uh, the catching coach in me says pitching duel, but it's always fun to see some homers. Are you pro I'll go or, pitching duel. Are you pro or anti shift? Uh, pro shift. I love the strategy that kind of goes into that. It's the best sunflower seed flavor. Oh man, I haven't had seeds in a minute. Let's go. I think it's sweet and spicy. David's seed, sweet and spicy. The seed is an ass. Artificial turf or natural? <laughs> artificial turf or na- turf or natural grass? Uh, coaching me wants to say turf. That seems like less work, but then there's definitely that. yeah, yeah. There's definitely something that uh. Yeah, I'm going to go turf. What's your favorite MLB ballpark? Um, I'm trying to think of ones that I've been to. I got to go Comerica. I was a Tigers fan growing up, so Comerica. But if you weren't a Tigers right. fan, would that be one of your favorite? That's a, f- Probably that's a not. graveyard, brother. Yeah, it is. Um, Here, I'll give you, poor, I'll give poor, you a... Poor Maggie. Give I, you, I'll give you a 1B. Uh, a unique one that probably a lot of people haven't been to, I'm going to go Toronto. PNC is really good as well. I have worked for the Pirates and have not been to PNC. Dude, I'm telling you what. I'll send you a picture of, of, of uh, someone posted a picture of it the other day. And, uh, oh, it's, just, it's, it's It's small, but it's like homey and... Mm-hmm. Oh man, it's just... I And I'm a Cleveland fan. I hate Pittsburgh and all things Pittsburgh, but uh, we, I, I went to college outside of Pittsburgh for a year, and one of our kid that was at, in our high school a couple years ahead of me was in the bigs with the Pirates. So like we'd go watch him, we'd go there a lot. It's, it's, I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's small, but it's, I gotta, it's, it's homey. I gotta get there one day. I gotta get there. All right, last question I got for you: Adam Sandler or Vince Vaughn? Oof. Uh, Vince Vaughn, the quotables. Yeah. You gotta have the quotables. Yeah, he's got all, he's got all the quotables. Yeah. Wedding, wedding crashers, I still quote like to this day. He you got know, to, you know, boys. You got to. So. <laughs> all Comes right. out all the time. Coach, thanks for coming on today. Uh, everybody that's listening in, this will be our second episode back uh, since we took a break in the summer. We're hoping to get back on every other week. Um, we've got probably six or seven coaches lined up. So hopefully, uh, you know the 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 well doesn't run dry, and we keep we keep banging these out for everybody. If you guys haven't subscribed, if you're listening listening to this on Apple or Spotify, you can find us uh, obviously on Apple or Spotify, on uh, YouTube as well. If you want the video version, um, you know, like, share, comment, it helps us all. Uh, Coach, I appreciate you coming on, and we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, man. 